Alright. So for our camera uh, man today, my name is Sarah Doyle, Chair of the Academic Staff Steering Committee. I appreciate everybody for coming today. I hope you're enjoying your lunch. Um, we're going to talk about what we're learning and what we're learning from this event. Um, I also would like to take a quick moment just to introduce um, the members of our, our Academic Staff Steering Committee. And I'm looking for you, so if you help me, Don. <laughs> about human resources and the like. And so we have, everyone knows Michelle Fecto, she's the regular director of our union. Uh, and then we have Layla Asante, Layla Asante Apia. Absolutely, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> Not an easy name. <laughs> and she's the interim um, vice president. So she is it, president. Is it interim? Vice President for Community Forces. And then I just met Ellen Barton. I knew her name, but I didn't know what she looked like. So she is our uh, Associate Provost for Academic um, Personnel. And so we're going to get started with, um, the purpose of this was to, um, like I say, get information because there's a lot of um, uncertainty and some information and some um, um, just, we wanted to share information. Of, there's confusion about HR and what they do and, and things like that. So we wanted to get an opportunity to, for them to share so we can all be on one page. So um, uh, Lila yes. has a presentation for us, and then we're going to go continue from there. Yeah, I think Ellen has one as well. Oh, she's going to us. But you have a PowerPoint. Yes, we both do. Yeah. Oh, okay. so I'll start and then I'll turn over to Ellen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I, um, I'm looking forward to sharing with you um, some more information that you may not be aware of about human resources and um, share with you how we partner um, with. Ellen and academic personnel, as well as other collaborative partners across campus. So my goal today, outside of that, is to give you some background around HR transformation. I know many of you are, um, have heard of HR transformation, and um, it's been a while since we transformed. It actually will be five years, um, July of this year, you can believe that. So, but this, that's, this was a significant change for the campus and for human resources. So, you know, you won't be surprised that we're still trying to deliver on our promise as it relates to the goals and objectives that we had set out for, for the cabinet's approval. So, let me talk a little bit about our delivery model prior to 2013. Again, we went live July 22nd, 2013. But I'll give you some background even before this. So, um, maybe in 2012, maybe even 2011, um, the president at the time, President Gilmore, had convened a partnership um, with Huron Consulting and had asked them to come in and do a business process review of a number of units within uh, the university. And HR was one of them. And as, as they went out and did an assessment and spoke to leaders, um, a number of folks across campus, their goal was to learn, you know, how does HR services get delivered today at that time on campus? and what are the needs as we move forward if we were to try to um, improve the particular operations and the support that the human resources practices are providing to the campus overall. And their assessment yielded a recommendation to then transform human resources because we had a very bifurcated process, and I'll talk a little bit about why that was, um, and we had units who were not getting service as well across campus, so we wanted to kind of level the playing field. You'll see some of that up here now. So at the time that we transformed, 
we had four departments in where we defined a central HR, and that's held in AAB, that's where we're housed. We had three HR consultants providing ER support, a number of issues in handling that across the campus for um, obviously 13 schools and colleges and all the divisions that we have. And they serve as business partners um, to the entire campus. Um, they really were not valued as true business partners. You can imagine having three for a campus of this size is not is somewhat inadequate. Um, they brought in, uh, were brought in after decisions were being made to fix problems. So it really wasn't that effective, proactive approach. Um, the central, the centralized model um, existed with many day-to-day -day HR functions embedded in the units. So we had roles, uh, different schools and colleges and divisions had their own HR personnel that they hired to, on their staff and they reported to various roles within that college or school or division, i.e. The, the dean's office or the BAO, et cetera. Uh, some roles were 100% HR work and some were not. So that speaks to different levels of support being provided um, across campus. Um, also, HR transactional activity, that means any employee staff changes that occur throughout the year. We do about 30,000 employee staff transactions across the campus a year, had high error rates. So um, central HR primarily focused on oversight and compliance, um, since you kind of get that, that perception of being the police. That's not how we want to be seen across campus. There was a lack of clear structure for handling employee relations issues, not knowing who to go to for what and recruitment was not represented at all as a functional area to support the campus. So that's where we were at the time prior to transformation. This just uh, diagram kind of depicts how the service levels were, were divided. So we had these uh, four, really three areas within um, the central HR. We had OED, training, development, et cetera. We had an employment service center. Um, they did a lot of the employment transactional type work. And then we had a combined total comp and wellness area as well. And all these areas reported up to an associate vice president. And then we had the business units, that's the schools and colleges and divisions, handling all of these transactional activities. They were managing ER issues um, with, with the business affairs office as well. And so we had a lot of inconsistent decision making because it was so highly decentralized. And we had as well partners on, as we do today, at the time, we had labor relations, which of course is for the all non-academic unions um, management. OEO, um, OISS, general counsel, academic personnel, and we had payroll. Since then, you will see that we have uh, two of those units are now a part of human resources. So we've streamlined that piece to some degree. So then we transformed ourselves, and our goals for transformation was um, a new team structure that allows for the uh, SCDs to have direct access to capable, dedicated HR professionals located within the unit. So the way we organize ourselves is we have seven, we created seven new roles within HR, um, and, uh, led by um, an HR director for each of the five regions. So we had five regions that we originally went out live with. Um, and so, at that point, we had a director for each of the regions, and they each had a complement of seven um, new positions. The HR consultant, senior HR consultant, they're like on the front lines, they're the first point of contact for any issues that a school or college or division might have. Each consultant has a complement of units that they support, um, and then we also have the um, talent management coordinator, that's a new role that came about with the transformation. They do onboarding, they help with recruitment, and then we have administrative folks who are doing um, employee staff changes, originations of, e of EPAFs, and approvals of those EPAFs. And they'll, so it's, a, it's kind of a, a flat organization. They all report up to the HR director. The HR director reports up to myself as, a, as the EDP uh, of HR. So then um, uh, we also were looking to have, um, again, professionalism brought to HR, um, allow for oversight for HR compliance, training, policy and procedure, and consistency of services across campus. As well, the creation of career paths within HR. We didn't have very much of that because it was so decentralized in the former model. Increased opportunities to leverage technology, best practices and processes to better serve Wayne State. So some of the areas of opportunity that we went into transformation with was really not having a robust technology platform. And so, you know, trying to leverage technology to create efficiencies has not yet really occurred in the way we want 
to want it to occur. We're now going through a banner upgrade. I'm sure many of you have heard about the banner reimplementation. That's a partnership with myself and Ellen and others um, across campus on both the student side and the administrative side. But for the HR organization, based on our um, uh, recommendations from our outside um, consulting firm, Strata Information Group, or SIG, they recommended that we rebuild HR banner. So that's going to be a two-year, two, two-and-a-half-year effort that's going that's underway right now. So you'll be hearing more about that. But that's going to create some efficiencies. Uh, we're going to be looking at our business processes at the same time to really streamline and simplify the things right now that seem very complex. And then we also were seeking to have a more formal working relationship with all collaborative partners that um, allow for consistent responses to employee-related questions. And um, we still have our opportunity there. You know, that's kind of why Ellen and I we meet weekly, because we're working very diligently to make sure that we have an alignment of how we do our work so that we have a um, more consistent process across campus for employee-related issues. So this is now our um, model post-transformation. You'll see that HR Client Services is that new department within HR that was formalized. A lot of effort went into this group. It's about, I would say, 60 to 75 percent of our workforce works in client services. They're our front-facing, front side of the house. So our HR consultants serve as first point of contact. Um, they do policy review. They do performance um, support for the clients employee relations issues, they are now serving as a first point of contact for labor relations related to non-academic unions like p &A staff and some other ones that are um, centrally um, focused within fp &M. Um, And then you'll see at the bottom, you'll see the centers of excellence. These folks have deep subject matter expertise in these areas, i.e. labor relations, payroll, compensation, benefits, wellness, and our service center, which is like the entry point into benefits for uh, tier zero, tier one questions, and then our decision support and technology group. And so we, we really have worked hard to have a one point of contact, one HR approach, so that when someone calls in and talks to their client services group, um, that individual can kind of reach back in to the back side of the house, so to speak, and get that expertise needed to provide support to the client to address their needs. Um, as you know, based on how we're organized across campus, we have a lot of collaborative partners. So academic personnel is a key one for us, OEO, um, OISS, as well as general counsel. So we do a lot of partnerships and um, communications and making sure that we have all our ducks in a row um, to have a streamlined approach when dealing with issues with the client across campus. And this is the, just the current org chart. Um, we have about 70 um, three or so people in human resources across campus. The areas uh, bucketed in by the red brackets are the client services group. That's the new group that was created when we went to HR transformation. We took a lot, anyone who was doing 100% HR work was then mapped to one of these roles that you see here, and those are an awesome interview process as well to determine uh, what role they would fit into. And then we also hired from the outside, so we kind of took a look at our current level of talent and then try to supplement that with new talent that we bought from the outside market. Um, and then you'll see on the left there, um, these are all of our centers of excellence. We now have payroll and labor underneath HR, which was not in place at the time we transformed. So that gives you an overview of HR. I'm going to turn it over to Ellen, and she'll go through some um, topics as well that I think would then lead to some questions that you might have. Thank you. This is the largest steering committee I've ever seen. <laughs> um, I wanted to address question two, as posed by, oh, wait a minute. So I thought that I'd talk a little bit about how it is that we work together, how it is sometimes we work apart, and so I, I chose some areas of interest that I thought were relevant to um, your steering committee. Um, 
for economic stamps. Helen, I'm sorry, but we can't hear you. Is that better? Yeah. Can I No. All right. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, what I did was I looked. I chose some key articles from the um, from the contract, the New England State University AAPAFT um, union, and um, I thought I'd start out with something that's always interesting for everybody, and that's compensation. So this is also a good example of. Uh, work in my office and in Lila's office, but there's a sort of a se separation of set of specializations. So in terms of salary for economic staff, that runs through my, my office. And, you know, most of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with that, with that process, um, whereas HR handles the benefits. And so that's an example of, of um, working somewhat independently. Um, another article that's been of interest I give here is um, leaves of absence and what and um, the that's article 13 of the of the contra contract. And there HR is responsible for short term disabilities. So for example the birth of a child. Um, whereas I negotiate um, and then of course send to the union. Um, modified duties for um, members of the bargaining unit and also um, ESS interruption, which can be, which can, which can take place, um, that's supposed to, I'm sorry, that's supposed to pay, say, uh, one semester, one time. So that's a little bit of detail about, about Article 13. Um, Article 20, I think is, particularly relevant because that Article 10, 20 is about term appointments. Okay. And here's an example where um, the two offices work together um, in my office and in HR. Um, there's work together towards the initial contract. There's onboarding work, work that tends to be done in, in, in HR. And then there, there are contract renewals and contract non-renewals. And so that's an, and what I would like to say um, that a, quite a bit of, of that work, the initial contractor letter of offer, the contract renewals and the contract non-renewals, um, the provost office templates are the place to go for those, um, you know, for the standard approved vetted language for the letters of offer. And those tem templates can change. So to be sure that you're all working with for, you know, this is relevant to you, um, it's important to go straight to the provost office website to look at the, the, the letters of offer, standardized language and such, and not just uh, go back to the last time you might, someone might have, might have written a letter of offer. Um, the academic personnel offices uh, sends out the guidelines and such for the annual review for job performance, professional achievements, service based on factors, um, and then also the ESS review. We send out we, we send out the, the templates and the materials um, suggested and the procedures of ESS review, which as you know moves through departments and units in school and school and college and division units as well. Um, Article 22, tender procedure, is um, of great interest to the uh, academic staff who are on uh, tenure track committees, um, librarians and archivists, and there may be some more, but I don't, I can't, I didn't identify. Okay. Um, and then the promotion procedure, which is Article 23, um, utilized utilizes the academic staff prom promotion and tenure committee. So, um, and that also covers all academic, academic staff moving through the promotion lines. Um, and Article 25, personnel, 
personnel files. HR handles the electronic request for um, personnel files. And also Article 27, um, 27 um, tuition assistance and the, the member of the academic staff would, would go to HR in order to um, learn about how to, how to submit a request and what the process is. And then finally, I wanted to look, uh, take from Article 30, the University of Water Committees, and I want to make a, an especially uh, enthusiastic uh, invitation to participate in shared governance in this, in this way. And um, quite a few of the university uh, committees are relevant to academic staff because you're such a large and diverse group. So tenure track uh, academic staff can, uh, can participate in the university research grant pro program. These are all uh, Article 30 committees. Mm -hmm. Academic staff, as you know, has a professional development program, which is funded at $30,000 annually. And ASPDC also awards travel grants, although I'm not quite sure who it funds that. It's something I need to learn. Um, and for those of you who are here as uh, ASPDC um, members, please remember that we ask for your information on, on the uh, um, Professional Development Awards a little earlier this, this year, starting now. Um, so, um, another Article 30 uh, committee, of course, is the Academic Staff Hearing Panel. Um, there's one academic staff member um, on sabbatical leaves um, and, and leaves that are directed at academic staff, staff. And then finally, the Educational Development, which is really run through through the OTL also has, you know, are also um, um, welcomes to, uh, grant proposals across faculty and academic staff. So those are, I thought, some of the articles that were most interesting in terms of how it is that, that the Academic Personnel Office and the HR moves through our global processes. Okay? Michelle, do you have um, I, I was just had a couple of words and I, I know that um, Lila has to leave a little early so I want to make sure there's opportunities to ask questions. Michael's telling me to speak up, sorry. Um, uh, in general, you know, the, the union's role is, is to help direct you to the people that you need to talk to. Um, uh, and we generally ask that people try to resolve it on their own before the union gets involved, we'll give you information if you have questions about your rights under the contract um, or employment law, um, but generally to um, go to the administration, or including HR, and if there's questions or problems or something doesn't seem right, then to come to the union. Um, so. Uh, and we've had, uh, so this change is very educational for the union as well, um, because these changes, uh, for instance, the, um, you make the request to HR now for a, uh, to see your personnel file, because that was new to me. Yeah. Oh, that's, no. yeah, it's, it's been not that way. Yeah, it so I, uh, so if somebody makes a, a bullet a <coughs> request, they should send it to... It goes through Academica and the electronic. They log into Academica and they'll see a link that says uh, personnel file, and they click on it and they make the request through that process. Okay, so then... Okay. And, then it's and then we execute it. I just tested it the other day and the, uh, the return was two or three days. Mm -hmm. Okay, Maybe there we go. But anyway, I, I'm going to yield my time to questions and participation. Thank you so much for each of you for sharing your pieces about what your specialties are. And what we wanted to do, we asked for questions from our academic staff. And um, we've developed some questions. Some of, some of those have been answered by the presentation. Uh, the first one was, uh, explanation of the structure and the current structure of HR and, set, and such. Um, another question, these, this, these questions can go 
to anyone who wants to answer, um, particularly they are related to HR, but how does HR, Human Resources, work with the <coughs> academic administrators charged with overseeing our union members? I think I'm going to address that in the PowerPoint. But are there any other questions related to that? I have a question. If there's any question you might answer, you, since you brought up personnel records, the electronic records, what records do you get from your electronic records? Because there are records that are at the unit level, records at the, at the college and division mm -hmm. level, their records all across, and yeah. all of them constitute your records, right? Yeah, the official record is what's in our um, app extender file, um, the official university record that is anything that we received from your supervisor or as part of your benefit on onboarding or your compensation information, your offer letters, all of that, employee staff, changes that have occurred on your record since you were hired, they get uploaded by our staff. That's um, based on what they have put into the system, and that's your official record. Now, we know that sometimes a unit may have supervisory records of some kind where they've taken some supervisory notes. Those typically are not uploaded or provided to human resources to then put into your electronic file. But there are a lot of records at the local and unit level that are quite relevant to the professional life and careers of our of those people who are employed that are not in the electronic record. Yeah, so we invite that information. We don't have a any type of rule or policy that says that it should not be forwarded to human resources for your um your electronic file. It may be an opportunity to work with some of the units or Ellen's office as well for the schools and colleges to reinforce that um, so that we prefer to have an official record and that it be complete. That's our goal. Because, well, uh, for instance, under the, our contract, um, people have the right to see their promotion and tenure mm -hmm. files and the redacted um, mm -hmm. evaluations. They have the right to see if, if there is uh, any negative, you know, their annual reviews, sure. their um, you know, comments or stuff that affect their employment right. um, that are usually kept at the department level. Um, so, uh, so opportunity. yeah, and it's the yeah. and it's the, under state law, the uh, employer is supposed to provide that within a certain time frame. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, and it's under our contract. We have so I, we just want to make sure whoever's in charge that it's compliant. Yeah, I think that that goes back to having the partnership. To be honest right. with you, because um, there very well are could be some documents that the units are not forwarding. Right. Um, so therefore we don't we can't upload what we don't have. Um, so that may be an opportunity to reinforce that through communication with the schools and colleges. Right. In the past yeah. the uh, provost office would request that the documents be sent to the provost office. Um, and then our members would either see hard copies or get electronic copies at that point. Yeah. So that's um, so I do have a list of questions. Okay. <laughs> um, so I like I said we could you know go through the questions and um, answer whoever wants to answer. Um, the next question is kind of related to uh, benefits and the receiving of benefits or the denial of benefits. So who should a person go to for both of those things? Yeah, anytime um, an employee has a question about their benefits, how to, how to enroll, how to make changes, um, anything related to that, we would encourage you to contact the HR Service Center. They're at 7-3000 um, is their extension. They're our first point of contact. Um, they handle Tier 0 and Tier 1 questions. Not everything can be addressed through Tier 1. So they then will triage any particular issues to the appropriate person in the benefits and wellness department. Okay. And, and can I ask a follow-up question on that? Well, can you explain yeah. like the tier one, tier two? Right. Yeah, tier, that yeah tier zero is just information you find on, on, on the uh, website. That's all tier zero is. So it's easy for you to find it without, it may not be something you need to go and call somebody for. You would just on your own go and look on the website and gain that information that you have. And if it doesn't address your questions, then you would call into our service center. Tier one are your basic, very common 
questions are answered at the lowest level by our customer advocates and then based on the complexity of your needs they would triage that question to higher ranking folks who have expertise in health care, benefits, retirement, etc. So my follow-up question is, um, and maybe it's ha in the past I used to have a, a list of the people in Total Cop and Wellness mm -hmm. and for instance um, Albert Bowman who was no longer here. He's no longer here and was very worked with the union very well. We knew our contract. <laughs> right? um, so yeah. so, oh, sorry, it's a can of worms. Well, people, his position was eliminated. <clears throat> so, yeah. and um, so good. Why couldn't we talk about there, people and personnel other issues? That's not really appropriate to talk about his specific <laughs> issues. Okay, but, uh, yeah, so let me go back to my question. Um, so, but he was somebody that I knew handled like a, a uh, yeah, or uh, Miriam Wilson for years handled retirement and was it, had expertise and knew our contract. Yeah. Yeah. So there, are there people assigned to different types or is it just sort of general at this no. point? No, I mean I will say the benefits um, and wellness group is undergoing some reorganization. Um, so the HR service center was not, has just been moved back into benefits. So because of the reorg, um, there's still some tightening up of transitioning. However, yes, we do have people who are specialized in certain areas. FMLA would be Charlene Alleman. Um, and we can provide this information through, through a central source to, to give that to you so you have it as a that document would be great. reference mm -hmm. without going through all the names right yeah, now. Yeah, that, that, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, that's probably uh, Cynthia, I just have a real quick question. Oh, sorry. Because this is a personal issue with me. I get an IMED issue that I have a limited number of days to appeal. And I have not been able to find anyone at Wayne State to talk to about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I you have to give me a call. And I'm happy to get you to the right person. Is there a person I can talk to about an IMED issue? Oh, yeah. You can talk to Diane Daly. Thank you. Yeah, That's she's the director for the uh, benefits group. Exactly who she is. So in the uh, list yeah. that you're going to provide, as you said. Yeah, it would give you more of the who, who and what it, by, right. yeah, by okay. discipline. Because yeah. I noticed that on the EOB that comes from IMED, with what benefits were paid out, mm -hmm. there's no phone number for IMED to call <laughs> to discuss the claim of IMED. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, the so next you question. Get, I met a, you get what you pay your service provider, they don't match, but you call your service provider and they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, but I can't find anybody in you know. I paid over $200 what I met said I should have paid, but I can't get this resolved and I had 80, 89 days or something to appeal it. So, so thank you, Tammy. And so we, what we want to do is avoid like a personal case by case because I know our guests don't have a lot of time. But if you do have, I know she's here and Ellen's here, and we can get some follow up information to you as far as contact management. That's the purpose of this. But what we want to do, if we could, avoid like a each case by case, asking each case by case, and just here for general information. And so our next question, and I did ask for um, from questions from academic staff, so here's what we have. Um, so if we can kind of get through this, because I know our guests have to have some other uh, obligations that they have to get to. Um, the next question is regarding FMLA. Um, should our members always be advised to use FMLA for medical leave or other? Yeah, so we typically will always advise you to use anything that you have as a right to you under the um, federal, state statutes, as well as the contract. Um, so if someone comes to sit us and talks about an issue they have that would qualify, or we would point them to the FMLA statute in the contract, and we would certainly encourage you to do that. It's your choice to do that. But yes, we certainly don't want to violate someone's rights by not, by not informing them of what their rights are. However, with FMLA, we have found that our members have been given very bad advice across the campus on the relationship between FMLA and the rest of their benefits. And that is, you can perhaps comment, she's our FMLA expert, but she has to straighten out stuff all the time. 
Yeah, and if there are some specific issues that you're seeing as a recurrence, then we should talk about that. It might be helpful. Yeah. Um, um, I, <clears throat> and I, what I usually tell people is, you know, the, yeah. so, oh, what I usually tell people is, you know, the FMLA is there. It's an option that they can take, but our contract sometimes is easier to use. Um, for instance, you don't have to have a medical certification form filled out by, you know, your doctor. You, um, if you're on, you know, you just can bring in a, a note or if you can work it out with your chair and just use your medical, long-term medical leave or short-term medical leave. Um, it's, it's an easier process rather than getting the form and going through FMLA stores. Now, there's certain advantages to going, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, and I think it's something that you have to talk through and figure out what's right for you. But we've found in, uh, that it's, uh, some people are hounded that they, you must go on FMLA and they don't know the contractual rights. Mm -hmm. And so if they understood the relationship between the contract and the FMLA, that that would be, that would be helpful. Um, uh, for instance, people can use under our contract sick days to take care of their family. And it seems like that's, I have to constantly make people aware that that's a right that we have under our contract. So a lot of the HR people, they just don't know. And um, so, but help, you know, hopefully they will well. So. Well, there could be some opportunities to, we do have um, quarterly meetings, if not more often, with yeah. our HR consultants and directors. Right. And that's an opportunity to maybe um, bring you in, Ellen, to kind of just make sure we're on the same page about or me. What, I'm happy to come. Or you, whomever. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're not, you know, um, opposed to that at all, but yeah. I, would, I would actually encourage it. Yeah, yeah I think it would be. Yeah, because yeah, it's rather than get it straightened out and everybody on the same page ahead of time mm -hmm. than have a grievance later. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly has something. Uh, I was just wondering, like, how are administrators trained on aspects of the contract? Because I feel like the interpretation of things related to sick time, for example, are very differently interpreted depending on what department you work in. Um, and just some of the comments you've made feel contrary to things that I've heard. And I don't personally believe that's out of bad intention, but like, I think there's a lack of uniformity. So I just was wondering for feedback on like, what training for administrators is offered related to the contract for academic staff. Are you saying, you're saying administrators? Who are you referring to? That's I mean, like, directors, directors, chairs, who's ever overseeing those types of things. Because I just feel like it's very, like, things can be very different depending on what unit you're working in. And if someone on an ESF track, I don't always know that I can challenge those things, or does it, it doesn't always feel worth my time and effort to challenge those things. Yeah, it's just question. a lot of conformity or uniformity. You want to address that? I think that um, <clears throat> you're, you're, you're correct in that training for administrators to work through the content, particularly in the uh, per particularly in the um, um, area of benefits. And um, we had a mechanism in place a number of years ago. There were regular chairs with checks. And I actually had a dean uh, ask me at the beginning of this year if that could be rubbed up again, and I plan to do so. And I think that um, this dean in particular said he, he wanted uh, chairs to learn more about HR, learn more about HR, especially with respect to, with respect to benefits. So um, I take your point. It's a good one. And I, I'm hoping to start set, setting up those workshops for the next year. Yeah, I will say, too, and something I need to you know, talk to, more to Ellen about, we have done because this has been an ongoing um, concern since I've been here uh, with um, the chairs, and not just chairs, but anyone who's in a supervisory type role where they're helping to manage and, and um, support their teams in some way, that we work with the deans. We have one dean in particular that we kind of work with to develop these tra chair training sessions around HR type related. We could maybe leverage that for other schools and colleges as well. 
So, Ellen, are you saying that you're going to include contract? Uh, Sean is saying contract in the uh, contract um, training in the, in the, um, the workshop. Sure, as you mentioned, the workshop. Because that's kind of what Kelly was saying, them being more familiar with our particular contract. Not every single detail, is, if I understand you correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I mean, for example, like, I know several departments, like, what constitutes sick time, it's very different. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel like there are some things that in my department I feel like are awesome, but that's not the same in another department. And I don't think that it's because people are trying to be mean or deny anybody things, but it's just a lack of awareness of what that means or what that mm -hmm. entails. And I think that that is really important to rectify, too. I, mean, yeah, I, I think that, um, I certainly think that workshops should also be developed. In, um, and I don't know if um, the best strategy would be to do joint workshops or like this, or specific ones in which um, I work with administrators and the union works with bargaining members. So that's a, uh, um, it would be interesting, I think, to do more workshops with, jointly. Um, and so I'll take, I'll take that under advisement, but I'll, I'll have to work with Charlie to see what those, because there's a line. In terms of my interpretation for the contract for administrators and Charlie's interpretation of the contract for bargaining members, and I wouldn't want to encroach on that. But maybe the answer to that is to have some more joint workshops. Well, it is a real problem in that people become chairs of departments, which is a very important role. It really, the politics around the departmental chair that dictates who teaches what, who does what research for what rewards, and so on. And there is nowhere that becoming the dimensions of why you become a department chair is that you know the, what the collective bargaining contract is. And a lot of the time, they just talk off the top of their head. And uh, it's a particular problem in the medical school because uh, many of the people are not only are they administrators, but they're doctors. And you can't tell them much. And so, and they don't have a lot of respect for contracts to begin with. And so we are all forever finding people who just are not familiar with the contract. Let me turn back to HR. Mm -hmm. HR changed considerably uh, the whole approach of it un under uh, the Gilmore administration. Mm -hmm. Because what he wanted was something like what he experienced at Ford. Mm -hmm. He wanted a an HR that was both professional in the HR way. And much of the stuff that went on in HR was insular around HR. So you, you talked about reforming the structure, doing all of these various things, and so on. Uh, the interaction of HR with the rest of, the, of our bargaining unit is, has been uh, not always a very favorable reaction. Well, HR is often seen as the people who show up on Friday afternoon and say, uh, give me your keys, uh, we'll, we'll get some cardboard boxes and ship your stuff home, don't come back. Mm -hmm. And then there's a cop along with them. Uh, that's not a very favorable image to, for, for HR. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, HR needs a lot of work in terms of the relationship sort of the overall relationship to the rest of the employees here at Wayne. The, uh, there's a real, it's, I think it's a real problem. You just, we just heard the business about Albert Bowman, who many of us relied upon for years to help us get through down there. When we discovered he was gone, we were angry. And HR had whatever purpose they had for eliminating his, his uh, his uh, position, but that did not relate, I think, to the to the kind of services he was always providing to us before. Yeah, and I mean, you know, anytime you have to 
make a reduction in staff, it's difficult. It's not an easy decision to make. Um, certainly, you try to do it in the best interest of all parties, but you're not going to satisfy everyone. I, I will say what's most important is that you identify the work that was being done by that individual, and you identify who should move forward in doing it mm -hmm. so that our delivery of those services are not suffering. Now, I will say it's been challenging um, because of the reorganization within that group, and so they're still working through that and trying to do it very expeditiously. But when I say it's been smooth sailing, it would, it's not. It's very difficult to make that well, I decision. I, I, I'm sympathetic to you to the problems. I know that. The, uh, the your interim uh, and that the, the last uh, and that there was a change at the leadership level mm -hmm. and uh, but I'm just I hope that you understand that the people here want to have a good HR operation. Well, we want the same thing. Well, we want that as well. I don't want to deal with personal things, but I'm telling you, I have given up on trying to get my uh, my. Uh, by payment for uh, medical, uh, the medical thing. I've just given up. I've just given up, and that has been a common complaint across a number of other people. I'm just not going to do it anymore. I'm not setting aside stuff because of the sheer, uh, it seems like, I mean, I can't even explain the behavior of the people I've been dealing with on that. But that's, and other people tell me that too, but I'm not going to spend any time on my so we do have a couple more questions um, that are out before. I know it's 1 o'clock and maybe some of you do have to leave. Uh, but our next question is about retirement. Who's, who's down for retirement? How <laughs> 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 okay. many want to retire right now? <laughs> so it's, we're saying who? <laughs> Which we know we heard who we're going to go to. We're going to get a list of That's who we, we should go to for retirement. Um, is that just a question? Okay. Who should we go to a particular person? Which we, but it's also including, a, which I, I guess that question will be answered when you get the list of people who. So our next question is regarding um, uh, compensation. And uh, is there someone in compensation, in the compensation area that can assist that can assist with issues with pay disparities. So compensation for AUP is managed by the provost office. Mm -hmm. This is not an easy question to answer. Um, the in the selective service or selective setting. Uh, government and in, in the contract there's a line, line that says equity can be considered. Right? There has not been a formal um, program, equity program in salary. Well, I don't know the complete history of my office, but uh, when I was chair of the English department, which is what I did before I, I came here, um, I was never able to affect uh, equity, equity, uh, equity um, and that was, that was too bad. Um, I think, well, let, me, let me actually contradict myself. I saw um, equity to a certain extent in hiring, but when you get, when you have um, long-time employees, they're in salary compression, so it's uh, a bad thing, but there is now at least, um, I just sent, I just uh, asked my office office for this. There is a equity form that I've, that I've seen used in terms of um, um, that, uh, that kind of, of request equity and, equity and salary. And then we did have some departments who um, Wanted to, wanted to move on equity, on equity um, raises, and that was possible. But as far as systematic attention to the matter, I would have to do some research and try to figure that out. All right. <clears throat> I know um, working on the gender equity mm -hmm. values, which. Uh, I know we're, there's some of us working on this gender equity 
uh, evaluation uh, assessment uh, project, and in that, in those meetings, um, my understanding is that Jackie Wilson, who seems great, um, not the not the president's no, wife, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the director of compensation, um, was talking about there's going to be a survey of salaries mm -hmm. and. Um, some alignment about you know um, of salary. So I was wondering how that might affect our members. How that would be worked out with the contract uh, provost office union. Um, and for instance, I have departments where the salaries are really misaligned, like big time. And um, just wondering if there could be at some point, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later people who could look at that and make recommendations to correct it. So uh, I don't, and I, I know that there's, money is always an issue, but um, but it's really discouraging to people and they want to quit and leave, so, so I, uh, just is there, in the future, with this review of salaries um, and looking at fairness, is there an opportunity to work together on that to uh, better align so I'll talk about the um, the compensation department in HR. We are going to be doing a university-wide compensation study. Um, it will be broad and cover both academic and non-academic, so that will be a partnership opportunity. That's what Jack I think, is sharing with you. We likely won't be able to get that on our agenda because of the other technology implementations with Banner and Talent Management until 2019-2020. So that is a little bit a ways away, but um, and don't want to speak on your behalf, Ellen. I think there are opportunities that we can partner now, based on how you may want to do that or look at it um, in whatever form to support that equity review, so that there's a standardized and um, best practice process of doing that. Uh, you have something related to that? Yes. Um, I would highly recommend that if there isn't something in place on salary equity and so forth uh, through the provost office to have one in the, in the near and near future because the pay gap analysis that we've been working on, Michelle are both and I and Lila is also on that committee, will be coming out very shortly and I'm sure that there are going to be some people who are going to want to find out more how they can they can address any inequities there might be and so forth. So that's going to that's definitely coming soon. So, um, so another question is related to uh, worker disability co uh, accommodations. So, can any of you speak on that, like how that affects, or what the policies are, or what what how that affects workers? Or yeah. So, so I actually because I get this all the time. Someone says I am disabled and I need to have my class, or I need to have this. You know, uh, I can't climb stairs or whatever their disability is. Um, <clears throat> and who do they take their request for a reasonable accommodation to? It should be the Office of Equal Opportunity, unless you say different. That's the formal office on campus. Uh, Nikki Wright's the director of that office and reports into general counsel. Okay. Should she copy the provost's office? Or did she copy me? I'm not sure. So just send it to OEL without letting them. Well, that is the place for, yeah. for yeah. discrimination. If any employee comes and asks us or brings up an issue around harassment, uh, accommodations due to uh, illness, we direct them to OEO. They don't have to copy us right. or their supervisor. It's really uh, it's a confidential process. Right. So they're not entitled to do that unless <laughs> you say different. That's not the recommendation we make. So oftentimes they might be able to just work it out with their chair pretty informally, but um, so, okay. I, I, think, I think the one issue with that and working out informally is you're setting precedent for the university that you want to have a formalized process to do to make sure that we're not accommodating one person in one unit and not doing the same for That consistency issue becomes an issue. I think that's a uniqueness here because this is related to our employees, and I know Kelly's here, as well as Sharice from 
our students with this facility. We have, you know, a support and such for students, mm -hmm. but where is that for the employees, mm -hmm. I guess? That, I think that's more the question that Michelle was talking about. There was also just a recent article about, like, how employee disability concerns really should be handled in HR when it's an accommodation request versus like an accommodation denial or discrimination thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a trend just like nationally of HR units really taking ownership over the accommodation process. Um, I don't I don't want to do it for employees <laughs> like other colleges. So I just don't really have an opinion, but that's just something that I've been hearing a lot at trainings that maybe worth looking into. Yeah, I mean, you know, we will work with the unit. Um, we'll partner with Nikki Wright's office and the supervisor and the employee mm -hmm. so that it isn't just a, it's a kind of a collab, it's one of those collaborative mm -hmm. efforts um, mm -hmm. that is impor important to have so that you understand the implications of the hardship based on the accommodation request that will be caused to the unit. So it is an interactive process. Because we do get a lot of employee calls, so I don't know if it's just like poorly advertise where you go, but we, we refer people a lot to OVO that are employees because they reach out to us. Okay. That would be the right thing to do because that's the office that supports that process. That is going to be a good thing to like push out more yeah. so people are aware. Well, if there are members, feel free to send it my way as well. Well, we have problems that don't rise, I think, to, to the level of OVO. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, I have, we, have, uh, we have a case that Michelle and I went the medical school. There's a faculty member who has, has a back problem, and the chair of the department decides you've got to be in your office all day and so on. You can't work at home and so on. The law is very clear that, that that's not that he's not covered by this. But it's a very troubling kind of thing because where do you go? It's not an OEO uh, complaint at this point. It should be just an accommodation for that individual person that conforms to what the law says. And the law should be, and the employment law should be something that, that uh, 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 HR has. So this is, this is where, you know, there's the separation of hu human resources practices across campus. That's covered under ADA. Um, and ADA is governed under OEO in, on this campus. So even though it's not a harassment, I'm not talking about Title VII harassment under Title VII, I'm talking about the ADA law, and that's the government of equal opportunity. That's the you know, campus that is designated to support that effort. And they are too helpful, in my opinion. Yeah. So it would, use, it would be useful to move OEO under you. I, would, <laughs> I don't disagree with you, because in every other university and organization I've worked for, we. We were the conduit and supervising and oversaw well, ADA claims, but that's it, not how it is here. The place it should not be is under the general counsel. General counsel has the function of advising on, on legal aspects and should not have administrative uh, jobs like that reporting to him. I, I agree. There's, I, I like the idea. I, I'm not sure if I heard correctly, but I, that if, like, the students have SDS, it would be great to have somebody, maybe, you know, because I know OEO probably has, I think it has three staff, yeah. but if there was someone who could help with just accommodations um, or advising on accommodations, and I'm not sure who that, just someone who's a, a little, who's charged with that question and helping our members, it might give a softer face to HR um, that we're there to help. And, or figure out a way to keep a good employee who might have a disability um, uh, and work with OEO, but do it in a, you know, a, a, somebody who's really familiar with the workplace and the workload that our members do and, um, and what, what makes sense. Um, the, problem, the problem with OEO is, as you say, they, have, they, they are employee poor, and uh, so it's if you're not getting a, a, a needed response or something from OEO, then what do you do? Well, you make a formal complaint, and then that takes months to get through all that. And all we're asking for is an accommodation on a practical kind of situation in a department, and that's easy to do if the people sit and talk about, talk to each other about what what is the situation and how.
And I'm happy to speak to Nikki to ask her what her thoughts are about what support might be helpful as a tier, you know, first point, if you will, right. of contact, um, and to see if there's some opportunity there. I'm happy to do that. So we really appreciate it. I wanted to um, do two things. Of course, I know some people are leaving. Um, but the PowerPoint presentation that you guys provided. Huh? Somebody asked. Oh, <laughs> asked what? For yeah. Oh, okay, okay. That you can be shared with. Is that okay to share that? Yeah, I'm happy to okay. send it to you. And yours too, Ellen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, that was a question. Okay, very good. And I wanted to give um, Mark a chance to make some announcements as well. Just, about, real, oh, just real quick, um, you, everybody has on their table, there's an event on Saturday. So if everybody's heard me talking and other people talking, Janice is a Supreme Court case that will um, make all public employees <coughs> right to work uh, potentially this summer. And so that would supersede our contract. So basically it's a kickoff event on Saturday, starts at 1030, it's for a few hours, come for as long as you can and check out. To, a little bit of teaching, a little bit of a speaker, and a lot of solidarity and rally. So please uh, come to this if you've got some time on Saturday. And then up here we just have a couple issues of the council communicator if you haven't seen that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And also just the handouts that you have, maybe we should kind of review those in addition to the, the council communicator. We have uh, this handout and the work of organizational chart. Oh, can we get that updated? Just the one that you have up there is right. not the one that we have. Right. right. Yeah, so I'm happy to update in the PowerPoint rest of the app. So we'll be Michelle all sure on the website. Thank you. Yeah. So Michelle had provided this. Can you just kind of explain what this is? Um, <clears throat> actually, Sarah asked me to provide this. Um, it's, it just explains some um, rights under the FMLA and, and our contract when it comes to leave. And so um, it, the, the columns on the, the last four, our article uh, 13, um, uh, or yeah, 13, and they, and they cite the, the contract provisions, and it ex just explains the different types of leaves that are available to you and the different categories, how they work. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you so much. Any, any last thoughts or comments? I just wanted to say that all my interactions with HR have been wonderful. So uh, I know that some people, there are incidents where it's not and so forth, but I think there are lots of people who are happy to be helping. I would like to say that the union does not get calls when they have wonderful experiences. We only get calls. <laughs> 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 so our, our point of view is, no, I appreciate your honesty. I mean, if you don't know what's an issue, you can't make improvements, right? So I appreciate that. I appreciate you being here, both of you. So I know that something that is really uh, an anticipated thing is what you mentioned about having a list. If we can maybe like coordinate, uh, uh, collaborate, going through like each line to say this person, this person, this person, like a contact person, like you mentioned, that would be great. And so yeah, we'll certainly give you that for benefits. Um, keeping in mind that. You always can contact your HR consultant, and I can provide or include a, an updated org chart in the presentation, but also include a secondary, um, more defined list by region, mm -hmm. so you can see what consultant supports what school or college. That might be helpful as well. Yeah. Yes. How many know who their consultant is? Okay, well that's someone said they didn't know they had a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a yeah. there's a gap there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.